Hello everyone and welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. In this video, we will be going over urinary tract infections as well as pyelonephritis, including diagnosis and management, so let's get to it. Let's begin with some basic terminology. When we talk about urinary tract infections, also known as cystitis, this is an infection of the bladder or of the lower urinary tract. The term pyelonephritis refers to an infection of the kidney or of the upper urinary tract. So how do urinary tract infections occur? This happens when pathogens from fecal flora colonize the vaginal introitus, and then these pathogens reach the bladder via the urethra. So if you think about it, this is why women are at higher risk of having urinary tract infections than men, mainly because their urethra is much shorter. When it comes to pyelonephritis, this can occur in one of two ways. Those same pathogens from fecal flora can reach the kidneys via the ureters, or this can occur from seeding of kidneys from bacteremia. Let's now go over what these pathogens are. With cystitis, the most common cause is E. coli by far. There are also other gram-negative organisms to keep in mind like Klebsiella, pneumoniae, or Proteus mirabilis, and then gram-positives like Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Symptoms of cystitis include dysuria or painful urination, urinary frequency and urgency, suprapubic pain, as well as hematuria. When it comes to diagnosing cystitis, if a patient presents with classic symptoms, you can treat with antibiotics. If those classic symptoms are not there, a dipstick can be obtained for further evaluation. In reality, however, you may see physicians who still obtain dipsticks when patients present with classic symptoms. If you'd like to learn about the dipstick or other components of the urine analysis in further detail, feel free to check out our other video about this. Obtaining a dipstick allows us to obtain a few different pieces of information. First, on gross inspection, the urine can appear cloudy, indicating an infective process. And then on the dipstick itself, we're looking for any positive leukocyte esterase, which is an enzyme released by leukocytes, indicating that there are white blood cells in the urine. A positive nitrite is also helpful because it indicates the presence of enterobacteriaceae, which convert urinary nitrates to nitrites. This basically indicates that there is bacteria present in the urine, and because of this, it has a higher specificity for a UTI than leukocyte esterase. When we diagnose a urinary tract infection, which antibiotics do we use? There are three to keep in mind as your first-line agents. The first is nitroforantoin, or macrobid, trimethoprin sulfamethoxazole, or bactrim, and then phosphomycin. Make sure to keep these in mind because they are high yield and are useful in a clinical setting as well. Let's now move on to pyelonephritis, which as you can see here are caused by very similar pathogens as we discussed earlier with urinary tract infections. And this makes sense given the pathogenesis behind urinary tract infections as well as pyelonephritis, with the pathogens coming from fecal flora. However, with pyelonephritis, keep in mind these additional pathogens, pseudomonas, enterococci, or methicillin-sensitive staph aureus, and methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Now, when it comes to the symptoms of pyelonephritis, patients can also have those classic UTI symptoms, but they typically will have additional symptoms like fever, chills, rigors, basically your systemic signs of illness, flank pain or CVA tenderness, as well as nausea and or vomiting. Pyelonephritis is something that needs to be taken very seriously and treated promptly because it can lead to various complications ranging from sepsis with or without shock, as well as acute renal failure. On physical exam, you can check for CVA tenderness, which will often be present. Lab findings that can help with diagnosing pyelonephritis include a urine analysis and urine culture, as well as blood culture. Interestingly, imaging is generally not needed except in the following situations. When you're evaluating for a process that requires intervention, like a stone or another obstructive cause, or when you're evaluating for a complication of infection, like an abscess, which would need to be drained. This is because these two conditions can delay response to therapy or worsen a patient's condition. So we usually obtain imaging in patients that are not improving despite therapy, are severely ill when they first present, or where you suspect a stone, which is when you notice a decline in renal function or urine output that's pretty significant. So how do we manage pyelonephritis in comparison to urinary tract infections? Well, this really depends on if the patient requires inpatient versus outpatient care. Inpatient management is recommended when the patient is septic or critically ill, unable to maintain oral hydration, or when an obstructive process like a stone is suspected. So if a patient is admitted to the hospital and is critically ill, we can treat them with carbapenem and vancomycin, and this is because carbapenem has anti-pseudomonal activity. Carbapenem also has activity against ESBL-producing organisms or extended-spectrum beta-lactamase-producing organisms. Vancomycin will be included here to cover against any methicillin-resistant staph aureus or MRSA. 
Otherwise, patients can be treated with piperacillin tazobactam, or piptazo for short, as well as a fluoroquinolone because these both have antipsudominal activity. If a patient is well enough that they don't need to be admitted, they can also be treated with an oral fluoroquinolone outpatient. If you find remembering these antibiotics overwhelming, make sure you don't understand what pathogens you're targeting because on a test question, you can use the process of elimination to figure out which antibiotic makes the most sense. And as we always do, let us end with a practice question so we can solidify our understanding. This is a really comprehensive but very informative question. Here we have a 41-year-old woman who comes to the emergency department because of a three-day history of fever and a two-day history of worsening flank pain with frequent and painful urination. She describes the pain as constant and says it worsens when she coughs or lies on her right side. She rates the pain as a 5 out of 10. Ibuprofen has provided moderate relief of her pain. She also reports some nausea but has not had any vomiting or change in bowel movements. Her medical history is significant for several uncomplicated urinary tract infections, most recently 8 months ago. Each infection resolved with antibiotic therapy. She currently takes no medications aside from her recent use of ibuprofen and is sexually active with one male partner and uses condoms regularly. Vital signs reveal a temperature of 103 degrees Fahrenheit, pulse is 76, respirations are 20, and blood pressure is 128 over 74. Chest auscultation discloses normal S1 and S2, and abdomen is soft. There is guarding on the right lateral side and tenderness to compression over the right costophrenic angle, and that's just a fancy way of saying that there is right CVA tenderness. So in this very lengthy paragraph, which is unfortunately how a lot of these practice questions are written, there are a few things that we need to keep in mind here, and I've bolded these for you. First is the onset and duration of symptoms. This has been going on for about three days with a fever and a two-day history of worsening flank pain with urinary symptoms. So this is an acute onset of urinary symptoms with flank pain and some systemic signs of illness like fever. She's also having some nausea as well as a history of several urinary tract infections. She's sexually active with one male partner and uses condoms regularly. This is key to know because it reduces the likelihood that this is a pelvic inflammatory disease process, which is something to consider as well. And then on physical examination, we have the right-sided CVA tenderness, which is a key finding here. Let's now take a look at the lab results. Here we have a BU1 and a creatinine that looks normal. Urinary studies show positive leukocyte esterase as well as white blood cells. And again, those findings make sense because leukocyte esterase is an enzyme that is released by leukocytes. And then hemoglobin here is normal, but the white blood count is elevated, with neutrophils being our predominant type of leukocyte here. We're then told that urine and blood cultures are obtained and sent for analysis. Antibiotic therapy is initiated. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? So we have a patient here who's presenting with all the findings consistent with pyelonephritis and is being treated for it now. So is there anything that really needs to be done? We discussed imaging and the indications for it, but does this patient meet the criteria for imaging? So the patient was just recently started on medication, so we can see how she does over time. She isn't severely ill either. She has a fever and an elevated white blood count, but this is expected with pyelonephritis. She doesn't have any hypotension or other signs of sepsis or septic shock. And she's also not presenting with any acute decline in renal function that would be concerning for a stone. So the correct answer here is E. All right, everyone, we hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please make sure to like and subscribe. And as always, good luck studying, everyone.